Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. Find a living in fisheries. The UAS Fisheries Technology Program offers online study from anywhere in Alaska, plus labs and workshops in many Alaska towns. Is most likely a chum. Find your living without leaving where you are. Fisheries Technology from UAS. The National Weather Service. Hello again, everyone, and thanks for joining us for this Sunday's edition of Alaska Weather. On the fire danger chart, uh, just a couple of spots here, Central Copper River Basin there, uh, Glen Allen, Gulkana, Gakona, and those areas. And up here on the northwest side of the Alaska Range, a more extensive zone from the uh, Yukon there, back to the west across the Koyukuk, Kobuk Valleys, almost right out to the coastline there across the uh, no attack valley and a good portion of the Seward Peninsula with some extreme in through here especially right through that area there and for satellite imagery for yesterday you can see a lot of clear skies up there on the north slope on out to the Arctic coast lots of clouds over the southern two-thirds of Alaska with uh, showery conditions a lot of clouds out here to the west as well covering the Bering Sea and then we had uh, clouds gathering here to the southwest associated with the next system. That all pushing up in, across, in toward the panhandle. That moved across last night and early this morning here. The front dissipating, rolling into Canada, but a lot of moisture here. Low pressure keeping it uh, pretty wet over the entire stretch of the area there, especially over the southern areas where uh, a net picked up about uh, 8,300 hundredths of an inch of rain, or actually that was Ketchikan. I picked up that amount and uh, uh, lighter amounts up to the north there with just a few hundreds around Juneau and uh, showers and clouds here north Gulf Coast, Gulf of Alaska and across the southeast interior. This is the area here brought the thunderstorms and the soaking rains into the Tanana Valley. Some more moisture in through here. Scattered showers back down to the south and west and some uh, thunderstorm activity. Not all that widespread as of uh, three or four o'clock this afternoon going on, but out ahead of this front approaching the northwest coast, uh, southwest flow in advance of that. Uh, warm temperatures up pretty nicely there for the north slope areas and uh, mostly clear out along the Arctic coast uh, for the most part, uh, VFR flying. And it uh, looks like less in the way of clouds here over the Bering Sea today, actually high pressure building out there. And, uh, but showers along the southwest coast here, kind of back up into the Nolato Hills. And that front, uh, most of the moisture put, uh, passing the Aleutians by to the south there with uh, really not much occurring over the uh, area from Nikolsky on back towards Shimia. And on the chart today, again, that weakening first band here coming up, just uh, maybe grazing the central Aleutians a little bit, but not much at all. Higher pressure starting to develop here over the eastern and central Bering Sea areas. And again, just a lot of clouds and showers, mostly over the eastern interior there south of uh, the upper Yukon Valley and less shower activity but still mostly cloudy across uh, well right out to the southwest coast some showers there Cusacoan Bay earlier today up around Nunavak Island and uh, thunderstorms there occurring up across the eastern Brooks Range pretty scattered isolated and uh, mostly off over into Canada then the uh, heavier rain here occurring over the southern southeast coast with the uh, lighter amounts on up to the north, as I mentioned earlier, and then rain moving on shore. We had uh, rain reported from Wainwright uh, all the way down to Point Lay and possibly Cape Lisbon as well. And for tonight, that front slowly edges its way eastward. So look for occasional light rain and fog or showers here along that frontal boundary there from about the central Arctic coast, uh, keeping it wet back toward Wainwright, maybe Point Lay and uh, on down across the northwest interior there, western Seward Peninsula, 
chance of some moisture uh, possibly reaching St. Lawrence Island with the weak trailing edge of that frontal system. Clearing skies here starting to dry out a little bit over the southwest interior and uh, showers ending out there later on tonight and in toward tomorrow morning. Scattered showers along the Alaska Peninsula. Aleutian Range here and uh, also for the western Alaska Range, a little more numerous area here, Copper River Basin on up into the central Tanana Valley with some isolated thunderstorm activity as well and still a trough off the southeast coast here so uh, showers will be really slow to diminish as this whole area continues to rotate northeast and then northward over the next uh, 24 hours and again out to the west high pressure over the Bering Sea and we've got uh, this area here again most of the moisture sliding off to the southeast or pulling back to the northwest but it looks like some of this uh, coming northward there and that'll join up with that front and tomorrow looks like uh, some wind and rain definitely for the central Aleutians on back towards Shimia. Stronger high pressure now over the southeast Bering Sea there, western Bristol Bay, up to about 1,000 millibars on the high center there. Uh, otherwise, there's variable clouds, patchy areas of fog for the uh, Pribilofs right up to the St. Lawrence Island area, still a risk of a shower there. And the moisture of that first front kind of slips on down to the south while this area here pushes off to the east and kind of gets hung up over the eastern mountains up in that area. So mostly cloudy, scattered showers across that entire area. That next trough, uh, pretty dry, probably just some low clouds and fog associated with it as it uh, clips the Barrow area. And tomorrow, most of the thunderstorm activity will be over in Canada and right along the eastern border here from uh, possibly southeast of Arctic Village and scattered on down into the northeast Copper River Basin, maybe the Wrangell Mountains. But uh, clearing out, increase in the northwest winds, means more sunshine, warmer temperatures here over the southwest interior, Kodiak Island, even the Alaska Peninsula, uh, the eastern part, high center right over or just north of uh, Cold Bay there. So uh, kind of holding on to some clouds a little bit, but should be a dry day. And showers slowly diminishing here across the panhandle as uh, the moisture now out to the west starts to push off to the southeast instead of just rolling right on in. And taking a look at Tuesday's outlook, uh, leftover moisture again from what comes down tomorrow into the southwest interior kind of shifts off to the east, so that may trigger a few showers, maybe an isolated thunderstorm up over the Alaska Range. And another batch of moisture up here, nothing heavy, but some showers there from the Central Brooks Range area back to the northwest uh, along the Arctic coast. We're possibly looking at some maybe some IFR there, low clouds, fog, and drizzle, maybe light rain, still pretty nice off to the east, but a lot of sunshine now, warmer temperatures, high pressure building in to this area, offshore flow down sloping off the Alaska range, so uh, pushing up into, back into the 60s and mid 70s in a lot of areas here, and then on Wednesday, even warmer, 70s into the 80s over much of uh, south central Alaska, back to the west, and maybe even up into the central interior. Showers, uh, not too much of a problem now, just uh, variable clouds, uh, hopefully some sunshine there for the pan. And most of the showers either off in Canada or up to, to the north there, uh, west of Elfin Cove, just east of Yakutat. Uh, and that's about it. And that next weak front weakening as it pushes eastward, but still uh, holding together enough to produce some small craft advisories here for the eastern Aleutian areas and a little bit of moisture there as well and just a narrow band extending off to the northwest there showers back of that low center west of kiska island otherwise just variable clouds out that way very weak low here just west of point hope and again nothing associated with that but some clouds and then the moisture with that trough farther off to the northeast temperatures this afternoon across the panhandle all in the 50s uh, 59 at metlakatla 61 at skagway two of the warmer locations otherwise lower to mid 50s 55 Yakutat, 61 in Valdez, 60 Anchorage, 55 Kenai, Homer, 52, Kodiak, 53 this afternoon, Golcana up to 62, 57 at Northway, uh, Delta, Big Delta, 51, Fairbanks, 56 degrees, one more sunshine at Tanana with 65, and there's McGrath with uh, 59 degrees. Up to the north, uh, more sunshine, 72 at Fort Yukon and 61 at Anatovic. Arctic Village up to 66. And the north slope, uh, very nice there. We had airfield at 72 degrees. New Ix at 66, but Barter Island just 50. Only 37 there at Barrow. 
and then cooler upper 30s to lower 40s with the rainfall and clouds there on the west side. Temperatures ranging from 60 at Kotzebue to 70 degrees at Deering, 44 in Nome and uh, White Mountain 48, just 39 over at Wales. And then down the coastline or down to the south and west, mostly in the 50s, the mid 50s there with uh, 51 at uh, McCoryuk and Kipnook with 55 at Marshall. And for the Pribilofs, right around 50 today, upper 40s, lower 50s here for the Aleutians, 50s for the Peninsula, and lows tonight, uh, 40s all through this area, all the way out to, to the west there, 38 St. Lawrence Island, lower 30s here, maybe some upper 20s uh, on the west side there, just uh, kind of working in behind that cold front that weakens and slowly edges its way east and southeast. Uh, lower 50s there over the upper Yukon Valley, otherwise everyone else mostly in the 40s to lower 50s. High for tomorrow, uh, very nice warming up, uh, warming trend continuing here for the Susitna Valley. Uh, tomorrow with more sunshine, more downsloping winds, and 70s, Susitna Valley, maybe down in the Kenai Peninsula, and also up over the upper Yukon Valley. So holding on to some clouds and showers, keeping it in the 60s here for the Copper River Basin, eastern Tanana Valley, 40 mile country, southeast coast, upper 50s to near 60. Flying weather tomorrow, marginal for the southeast coast to start with and some IFR lingering there, central western Arctic coast and maybe some areas of marginal VFR, Tanaw Valley, Copper River Basin down to, but probably not extending into Prince William Sound, possibly on the western Alaska range, IFR from the Ak Pin back to the northwest up in the crust uh, St. Lawrence Island. And then for tomorrow afternoon, uh, a little bit of improvement out there going maybe VFR in the north side of St. Lawrence Island. Otherwise, uh, lower conditions for the entire Bering Sea and the Aleutians. VFR, much of the mainland and maybe some marginal VFR, central western Arctic coast. VFR all the way down across the panhandle. Passes, Anatovic VFR, possibly coming marginal some moisture shifts northward. Same forecast for Adigan. Lake Clark and Merrill, wide open, good flying for raining, no problems. VFR for Windy, Isabel, Mentasta, and Portage. Tanita, Portage, all VFR. And Chilkoot and White, starting out marginal early, becoming VFR for the rest of the day. Freezing levels, four to 6,000 feet down through here, and six to 8,000 feet, more of a gradient up here with that front up to the northwest and uh, four to 6,000 feet out over the Bering Sea, a little bit warmer stuff coming into the central Aleutians. And icing threats, uh, really nothing really serious tomorrow, maybe some rime icing above 6,000 feet with that front out in the Aleutians. And areas of here, St. Lawrence Island, kind of back up to the Brooks Range, southeast interior, southern southeast coast, mostly above six to 7,000 feet. Upper level wind flow chart here, trough right through here, and uh, Otherwise, the main jet well to the south is slow now, beginning to uh, keep it showery still over the panhandle, but again, most of that will be slipping off to the southeast. This ridging here is going to combine with the high up over the Maring Sea. It's going to move in eastward slowly and uh, cause temperatures to rise quite a bit over the interior here by the middle of the week. And 9,000 feet westerly across the northern Bering Sea, lighter down to the south. Not too bad on the north and west flow here over the interior, but uh, stronger southwest interior across Kodiak Island up to 35 knots and some 40 knots southeasterly is approaching ADAC. Same pattern at 3,000 feet, lighter on the winds, 25 to 30 knots out through here. And northwesterly is 20 to 30 knots uh, from the Yukon Delta down across Kodiak Island, lighter for the peninsula. West northwesterlies or westerlies 10 to 20 through the interior, much lighter winds for the southeast coast. Turbulence wise, uh, Nothing serious, maybe some light to isolate moderate chop, low about 4,000 feet, Kodiak Island, Kamishak Bay, maybe the mountains here, central Arctic coast, a risk, and then also out over the western central Aleutians. And after the break, I'll be back with a look at the marine forecasts. A gust of wind, a rise in temperature, a drop in humidity. These changes in the weather might have a little effect on our daily lives, but during a wildfire, they can mean trouble. When unexpected weather changes cause a wildfire to shift directions or become more intense, the consequences can be devastating. Perhaps nobody knows this better than Bob Salee. 
At 17, he was trained to be a smoke jumper for the U.S. Forest Service, one of the firefighters who parachutes onto the scene of a wildfire. He had no idea that on his very first jump, he would face one of the most infamous firefighting tragedies in U.S. history. A small fire was burning in Man Gulch, a steep valley in the northern Rockies. Bob was one of 15 smoke jumpers set in to put it out on a very hot, very dry day in 1949. When we got there, the fire was about 30 or 40 acres burning along the top of the ridge. You could see flames in a few places, but mostly it was just smoke. It didn't look uh, like it was going to be a very tough uh, situation at all. But without warning, a change in the weather turned a fire that was manageable into a monster. Historians have speculated that a thunderstorm passed over and the updrafts that it generated sent the fire roaring into the gulch. Bob and his team were suddenly facing an enormous and deafening fire. The fire was probably 50 or 75 yards behind us. It was coming really fast. With the fire racing toward them, Bob and his friend, Walt Rumsey, desperately looked for a way out. In the smoke and the chaos, somehow they stumbled upon a path which led them up the gulch. When I got to the top, there was a lot of smoke and a lot of heat, and I wasn't sure whether I was going to make it or not. But amazingly, Bob and Walt survived. Twelve smoke jumpers and a forest ranger were not so fortunate. I guess we were just the luckiest people alive that day, and the other fellows uh, ran out of luck. The Man Gulch incident remains one of the most notorious fire weather disasters. But deadly shifts in the weather are still surprising fire crews today. Arizona, June 26, 1990. Firefighters battling the so-called Dude Fire were shocked by unexpected winds. The strong winds sent fire spreading rapidly in all directions. Six firefighters were fatally trapped in its flames. Four years later in Colorado, sudden strong gusts struck again, killing 14 firefighters on the South Canyon fire. There was no chance for escape when 200-foot flames blew straight for them. These are the stories that wildland firefighters think of with dread. They show just what can happen when you don't know what the weather around a fire is going to do. Weather is a key component to fire spread, and the firefighters on the ground are obviously concerned about what the fire is going to do in any particular time. So today, when a wildfire breaks out, even the most experienced firefighters won't make a move without consulting a key member of their team, the incident meteorologist, or IMET. IMETs are the National Weather Service specialists who are the on-the-ground weather experts for firefighters. There are only 63 of them in the country. The IMETs are there because the fire crews don't want to find themselves in the path of a fire while they're trying to fight it. They're there to watch out for the safety of the crew. When wildland firefighters are called into action, an IMET is assigned to join them at the fire camp. The IMET sets up a small weather office on the scene and will be on call 24 hours a day as the fire rages. Passing on forecasts to the firefighting team so they can plan their attack. While it's cool and moist under that when the IMETs get up in front of the group to give weather briefings, everyone pays attention. There's a the very real possibility that some of those eyes you look into in the morning shift briefing, if you make the wrong call, they might not be there the next morning. With lives on the line and time working against them, IMETs have to make some grueling decisions that can mean the ultimate success or failure of a firefighting mission. The job is a, a lot like what I would liken to a, a place kicker on a football team. There are certain times when you have to come out and do exactly what it is you're trained to do and do it exactly right because the game is on the line. I met John Saltenberger speaks from experience. He had to step up when he was called to Washington State in 1991. The city of Spokane was surrounded by wildfire. On the approach into the Spokane Airport that evening, I remember looking out the window of the aircraft and seeing fires all over. Northeastern Washington was under siege by a violent windstorm. 62 mile per hour wind gusts had sent an astonishing 92 fires raging into several neighborhoods. 
More than 100 homes were left in ashes. And one woman died trying to outrun the flames. The community was devastated and terrified by the thought of even more destruction. But to everyone's relief, the winds soon calmed down and the fires calmed down too. Mark Labhart was the incident commander in charge of the firefighting team. We were starting to get a handle on the fire. I was starting to feel a lot better until John came up to me and said, Mark, I need to talk to you. It was very bad news. John was predicting another windstorm, just as ferocious as the first one. I think my heart just sank at that point in time. The winds, if they came as forecasted, would certainly mean new dramatic flare-ups in the fire. The potential for a major catastrophe was in the making. At the time, it was only my second year as an incident meteorologist. I didn't want them to think that this was just some rookie crying wolf in the wind. I wanted them to take quite seriously the information that I had. We were literally making million dollar decisions on a forecast that was from a person that was fairly new. But Mark was convinced that John's forecast was right on. He contacted the governor, who declared a state of emergency and authorized the fire team to rush in dozens of extra crews. They would be in position to protect homes if the fires got bad again. And then, everyone waited. My stomach was turning. I slept very little. If the winds actually materialized, it was time and money well spent. If the winds didn't materialize as forecasted, uh, then they would look rather foolish. It was a risk, you bet. At first, nothing happened. But then, as John had predicted, the wind started picking up. And soon, intense fires were being stirred up again by an all-out windstorm. This time, with the extra crews in place, not one more life or home was lost. And John, the rookie incident meteorologist who made the conclusive forecast, was a hero. There was a lot of high fives for John. There was a lot of pats on the back for John. When you're able to forecast those things and they take action on it, everybody looks good. In response to a recent surge in catastrophic wildfires, the National Weather Service, part of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, has doubled the number of incident meteorologists on staff. IMETs are also trained to go to the scene of other incidents that could need on-site weather information, oil spills, search and rescue missions, or terrorist attacks. Welcome back. Uh, pretty light and variable winds here along the coast tomorrow. East-southeast, 10 knots on the north coast, southwest 10 to 15 there for the uh, south coast. Inside water, southeast 10 to 15 knots, more southerly, but no stronger for Lynn Canal. And then on Tuesday, pick the winds up, northwest 20 here for the north coast. Those become small craft advisories on down to the south, 25 knots with 9-foot seas. Clarence Strait, northwest 20, 4-foot seas. Stevens Passage, just 15 knots. North winds now for Lynn Canal, some higher pressure builds in over the Yukon, and, uh, but those winds will only be about 15. And for the North Gulf Coast tomorrow, variable winds 10 knots, light variable winds, Prince William Sound, Cook Inlet, a little more northwesterly south of the Forelands, much stronger from Kamishak Bay down across uh, the Barrens, northwest 20 to 30 knots blowing across Kodiak Island with higher gusts. And for Tuesday, uh, still light west variable type winds here for Northern Cook Inlet, northwest 15 for Prince William Sound, then these uh, northwesterlies continue to increase here, still carrying small craft advisories for the Barren Islands, east side of Kodiak Island, Kamishak Bay, northwest 15 to 20 for the North Gulf Coast. Bristol Bay, small craft advisories tomorrow, northwesterlies at 25, west-northwest 20 for the peninsula. And then for Tuesday, small craft advisories, Castle Cape to Sitkanek out of the northwest, 20 knot northwesterlies, northeast just 15 on the Bering Sea side of the peninsula and pretty light westerlies on the south side. For the Aleutians, uh, 15 to 20 knots southeast winds for the Fox Islands, picking up the small craft advisories here and closer to that front. And then east southeast 30 knots west or from Adak and Atka all the way out to Shimia. For Tuesday, these lighten up, become more southerly, 25 knots, 20 to 25, 25 to 30 off to the east, small craft advisories for the Fox Islands. And for the southwest coast, uh, westerlies at 20 knots north of uh, Nunavak Island to become 25 knots small craft advisories up to St. Lawrence Island, southwest 25 from the northern Bering Sea. 
Lightest winds will be found around the Pribilof, southwest 15. And for Tuesday, southeasterlies pick up the 25 knots there for the Pribilofs and westerlies at 25 or less for St. Lawrence Island. Definitely lighter winds from the west-northwest now for the coast, south 20 for St. Matthew Island. Up along the Arctic coast, uh, lightest winds on the east side here, west-northwest 15, 20 knot winds from the central coast all the way down to Cape Thompson, Cape Thompson to Wales, northwest at 15. And then southerly winds uh, from Wales all the way up to Cape Beaufort there at uh, south 20 knots, otherwise 15 knot winds everywhere else, south turning southwest, turning westerly on the east side. And for tonight again, uh, I've got this uh, cold front bringing a little bit of moisture into the uh, Arctic coast there back to the southwest, uh, just a weak trailing edge coming through the Bering Strait to St. Lawrence Island. Uh, building high pressure here over the Bering Sea, drying out, maybe clearing up a little bit here over the southwest. So good area showers, isolated thunderstorms right through there. Slowly diminishing showers for the Panhandle and that front pushes rain and some wind into the central and western Aleutians tomorrow. Stronger high pressure means stronger northwest winds there from Bristol Bay down across Kodiak Island and uh, Kamishak Bay, Barren Island areas. And uh, troughing here keeps chance of showers pretty good for the Copper River Basin. Talkeetnas and maybe the Chugach on up to the north and some weakening frontal moisture there to the west. Uh, some of that may kick off some showers around the Alaska Range, otherwise sunnier and warmer uh, back into the 70s and 80s here on, it's not Tuesday, but on Wednesday. Otherwise uh, for Tuesday, much drier for the Panhandle here, maybe some clearing, still uh, risk of some showers up to the north and maybe some moisture for the western north slope and Arctic coast, and this front keeps it damp over the eastern Aleutians. Have a great evening. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. From her rich and fertile valleys to the shores of her icy seas, from her fields and farms and shellfish beds and her many nurseries, for the finest of her flavor, for the freshest by far, Choose the things Alaskans bring to the market where you are. Products that we're proud to call our own. And it's all Alaska grown.